I love tight ends. That's why I'm always the one to talk about them here on the Fantasy Football Fellas. And today, we are talking about our top 15 dynasty tight end rankings. Before we dive into those, though, if you haven't subscribed to the channel already, make sure you do that. Turn on that notification bell as well because we are coming at you all year long, so you're not going to want to miss any of our content coming out, Dynasty content, NFL mock drafts, normal fantasy football content. So if you consume fantasy football or NFL content, you're not going to want to miss out on that. So make sure you subscribe. Turn on that notification bell. Without further ado, the top 15 Dynasty tight end rankings. Alrighty, we're going to go through our top 15 rankings here and put them into tiers. We're going to start at the very tippy top here with... Sam Laporta and Trey McBride in the S tier. Now with Sam Laporta, there is no debate. This is consensus, especially after this last year. He is the tight end one in dynasty formats. Uh, But his rookie campaign was phenomenal. 120 targets, fifth most of all tight ends, 886 yards on 86 receptions. That is indeed the rookie record, which was previously held by Keith Jackson with 81 back in 1988. Uh, And he caught 10 touchdowns as well, which, hey, was first of all tight ends this last year as well. Now with tight ends, I love talking about their yards per route run because, especially with these younger guys, because it is one of the few semi-sticky and predictive metrics we can use. Uh, A lot of these stats we don't really see translate from year to year, but when we see these yards per route run at, you know, elite levels, it shows that there's signs of success to come, and we've seen that with many other tight ends in the past, the Travis Kelsey's, Mark Andrews, George Kittle's guys we'll talk about later, Uh, but Sam Laporta, he was sixth of all tight ends this year running 1.76 yards per route. Now, we typically see a slower start for rookie tight ends and then see a spike in year two or three. But Laporta just kind of skipped right to it. He's like, I'm here. I'm arrived. Uh, I'm I'm him, right? Uh, so as long as he's attached to Ben Johnson's offense and remains the number two option for the Lions, I mean, there's a good chance he's a dynasty tight end one for many, many years to come. There could be some fluctuation, but I think Sam Laporta is in this S tier to, to stay, uh, and, and he is at the top of the S tier for us. And Trey McBride joins him there. He finished as a tight end seven last year, but really, like, I think it's best to look at his production from week eight on after Zach Ertz unfortunately got injured because that's when Trey McBride became the dude in the Arizona Cardinals passing offense. He was a tight end three in PPR formats. He was third in receiving yards, third in targets, second in receptions. And again, for these young guys, I'm looking at their yards per route run metrics as some sort of an indicator for their breakout, okay? He went from running, this isn't a joke, he ran less than a yard per route his rookie season. He ran 0.84 yards per route. Now in in year two, uh, or in year two, yes, correct, uh, he ran 2.08 yards per route. And from week eight on, he was running nearly two and a half yards per route, okay? That is a phenomenal number. That is a phenomenal spike that we want to see from these young tight ends as they start to break out. So whether or not they bring back Hollywood or draft a guy like Marvin Harrison Jr. or Malik Neighbors at number four in the NFL draft, Jonathan Gannon and Drew Petzing have made sure McBride and the tight end position in general, we saw it with Zach Ertz before he was injured, is a focal part of this offense. And they're going to continue to make that a focal point. So both... McBride, the Porter, they're both under 25 years old. They both have a ton of longevity in terms of, dy- in terms of dynasty formats, excuse me, making these two very clearly in the S tier, and I really don't think there's much debate around it. All right, let's shift our focus to the A tier now, where we have Mark Andrews, TJ Hawkinson, Dalton Kincaid, and Travis Kelsey. Let's start with Mark Andrews at the top here. Uh, what he has going for him is that he is the best pass catching option with limited receiving options in this Ravens offense. That is no disrespect to Zay Flowers in any capacity. But as of right now, Mark Andrews is the top option there. Zay Flowers can overtake him. But right now, that's what Mark Andrews has going for him. Now, what Andrews doesn't have going for him is that he's 28 years old and he's only played two fully healthy seasons over his six-year career. Now, I'm not going to nickel and dime a guy for missing you know, one to two games each year, but he's only getting older, and this is just something that that's worth tracking. Um, but he's everything that that you want to see from a top-tier tight end. Everything is still there. He ran 2.01 yards per route last year. That was fifth best of all tight ends. He drew a 22.2% target share when healthy. That was fourth best. He caught six touchdowns in 10 games, which was actually still tied for second amongst all tight ends. So even if he played those additional seven games, you know, he could have been competing with Sam Laporta, you know, for 10 touchdowns on the season. Unfortunately, though, age just it isn't just a number in dynasty. And the four to five year difference between Mark Andrews and the top two guys pretty firmly keeps him here in the A tier. Now, let's move on to TJ Hawkinson because I think 
Had it not been for his ACL injury at the end of the season, I really do think Hawk would have had a strong case to be in the S tier of our tight end rankings here. He wasn't this like otherworldly game breaker like Travis Kelsey has been in years past, right? But the volume metrics still went nuts in 2023. We're talking about a 24.3% target share, which led all tight ends. He was targeted on 25.6% of his routes. A one of every four routes he ran, TJ Hawkinson saw the football. That was the second best, and he had a 23% air yard share as well, which was also second best. He's 26 currently. He's going to be 27 going into next season. I'm sorry if you can hear my cat. She's trying to get all this attention down here, uh, and she's not having it when I don't give her the attention. But he's 26. We'll be going on 27 next season. Uh, but considering he's tied to Kevin O'Connell's system here and has had time to make a comeback from the injury you know, in, in future years here, I think he rightfully belongs at the top end of this A tier alongside Mark Andrews. Now, this is where things start to get interesting in our dynasty tight end rankings because next is Don Kincaid. And while there was nothing you know flashy about Kincaid's rookie season, there usually isn't with most rookies, okay? Like Sam Laporta is the anomaly of all anomalies this last year, right? Um, still, Kincaid was top 10 in targets, receptions, receiving yards. There's room for it to, there's room for all those to increase. He only ran 1.49 yards per route, but remember, we typically don't see those numbers spike until year two or three. There's still optimism there for that. Surprisingly, though, there's he, he's not as young as you may think he is. He's 24. He's like, he's still young. I'm not saying he isn't young, but he's not as young as you think he is because he's actually older than both of the guys in the S tier. He's actually older than Kyle Pitts, which is just like... I, just surprising when I was doing some digging here on, on Dalton Kincaid. I forgot how old he was coming out of, of um, Utah. But what you're banking on here, though, is that the first round capital, he's in an explosive Bills offense. You're banking on that turning into something special. And I think there's an opportunity for that in the coming year. Uh, could he be the Sam Laporta for this team, right? You have the Stefan Diggs and Amon Ra. Could he be the Sam Laporta for the Buffalo Bills? I think there is absolutely hope and potential there for that, uh, which puts him in this A tier because I, I think there is still a tremendous ceiling on Dalton Kincaid. He's still incredibly young, only one year in the league, uh, and we all know the talent he was coming out. He was a phenomenal prospect, drafted in the first round by the Bills. I think there's, I think there's fine validation to put him in the A tier here. Now, Travis Kelsey is the one that's super interesting because, look, elephant in the room, obvious thing we got to point out here is that he ain't getting any younger at 34 years old, and 2023 might have been the beginning of the end, okay? He played only 15 games, but he had less than 1,000 receiving yards, only five touchdowns. He had his lowest amount of targets since 2017 and the lowest yards per reception of his career, Okay. That's pretty disappointing. Yet he was still the tight end one at fantasy points per game last year. It it boggles me. It, like it, it goes to show how much of a luxury Travis Kelsey was in three, four, five years past, where it's like, man, you know what? He is crushing it. He is playing phenomenal. He is such an advantage. And now when he has a down year, we're like, oh man, is it the beginning of the end? But he was still the tight end one. It blows my mind. So you've likely only got two more years, though, like period at 34 years old with Travis Kelsey. Um, being a reliable fantasy option, but he's probably going to remain better than everyone else on this list. That would be my guess. So that keeps him in the A tier, but again, he's kind of fluctuating here. Like 34, he is the oldest guy on this list, but he's also better than 95% of the people on this list. So the end of the A tier feels comfortable for him, uh, and he wraps out, again, the tier of Mark Andrews, TJ Hawkins, and Dalton Kincaid. And Travis Kelsey himself. All right, let's kick it to the B tier. George Kittle, Kyle Pitts, David Njoku, Evan Ingram make up the B tier. Let's start with George Kittle because it is a roller coaster with him every single year, okay? He'll start off slow or, you know, average, um, giving you massive regret because you take him in the third or fourth round every year. Uh, he gives you three to four weeks of elite production, and your hopes just skyrocket, right? It's like, okay, I didn't make a mistake. He's back. This is what I've been waiting for. And then it'll kind of flip-flop between booming one week and busting one week where you're like, okay, it's, it's nice that I'm getting the, the, the skyrocketing points here, but also like, come on, man, we got to get consistent. And then he closes out the season the same way as he started it, which is mostly disappointing you, except for, what was it, 2022 where he closed out on an absolute tear. Um, that's the one exception. But this is what happens when you're in a loaded offense like the 49ers, right? Kittle absolutely automatically gets a boost, 
and is a much more safe asset when you don't have a Brandon Ayuk, a Debo Samuel in the lineup if they either of them miss time. Outside of that, though, you know he he's much more inconsistent than we really want to admit. Like I can sit here and tell you that he was first in receiving yards last year of all tight ends, first in yards per route run as well, but that really doesn't change the reality here. Kittle is a 30-year-old tight end that lacks consistency worthy of putting him in the A tier, and that's what it comes down to here. So I think he's, you know, again, this is a guy where, like, if you made a B-plus tier, I think he would be in that tier, but it, it, there's not quite enough justification here to put him in the A tier just because he lacks so much consistency and is in such a loaded offense. Now, Kyle Pitts is almost on the opposite end of the spectrum, right? Super young has lacked any resemblance of consistency. So let's just be honest. This is a make or break year for Kyle Pitts. Let's just make that very clear. Uh, almost all the excuses are out of the way now. You got no more Arthur Smith, no more shenanigans there. The Falcons, they have multiple chances to improve their quarterback uh, this year in the offseason, whether it's through the draft, if top 10 pick, whether it's signing a Kirk Cousins, trading for Justin Fields. They have they have a plethora of opportunities in front of them to upgrade their quarterback. Now that needs to happen, but that excuse can you know be ready to go out the window as soon as that happens. So I personally am sick and tired of seeing all the Kyle Pitts still, still he led the team in air yards, air yard share, unrealized air yards, yada yada yada. I talk to me when it actually translates into him finishing as a top five tight end with consistency. I don't think it's hard anymore to really finish as a top seven guy with inconsistent numbers. I mean, go look at Kyle Pitts' rookie season in 2021. He was a tight end six, and the dude couldn't put up a consistent game to save his life. We all thought he was disappointing that year, yet he was a tight end six. So talk to me when he's top five, and he actually gives you consistent numbers week in and week out. You can actually depend on him. Now, I'm harsh on Pitts. I really am. I've been out on him. Last year, I made it very known I was out on Kyle Pitts. I told you to sell Kyle Pitts in Dynasty Leagues last year, if you listen to our podcast. Uh... But there's also plenty of time, okay? There is plenty of time. He's only 23 years old. He is barely, just just barely older than Sam Laporta. I'm just giving you my justifications as to why, despite being so young and talented, he belongs in this B tier. We can't put him any higher. We have three years to look at here. And even with all the, the wonderful predictive air yards metrics, which only, you know, translate in like 70 to 80% correlation, We're just not seeing it yet. So we got to see it. We got to see it from Pitts first before we can bump him up any higher than the B tier. Now, David Njoku, it took us many, many years to get here. Maybe that'll be the same for Kyle Pitts. But we finally got the Njoku breakout in 2023, right? Uh, Career highs across the board, targets, receptions, receiving yards, touchdowns, everything of the sorts. You name it, career high for David Njoku. Um, It's actually kind of laughable when you go look at the numbers and how much they spiked. When they really started getting him more involved from week seven on, though, like, that's the point where you're like, man, David Njoku, is he a reliable thing each week? Uh, he was because he was a tight end one overall in PPR formats. He led all tight ends in yards after the catch during that stretch with 502, and he was second to only George Kittle in yards with 720 of them. Now, we need this to repeat in order for David Njoku to be any higher on this list, right? The yards per route run did increase to a career high, but it only went from a 1.55 yard per route run to running only 1.75 yards per route run. So it it increased, but it wasn't that drastic spike that we like to see in year two, year three, or you know, in any breakout season, you know, for the for the tight end position. But considering he's 27 is now seemingly broken out, you still got a few flexibility years here. I think he's a perfect fit into this B tier. I think it's exactly where he belongs. Because again, he's not this upper echelon guy, but he's also not a guy that um, by any means is going to like lose you a week or has a, a tremendous amount of question marks around him. Like we'll get to some of these guys in the next year, but we got to wrap it out first with Evan Ingram. And I'm going to, here's what I'm going to do with Evan Ingram. I'm going to read you a list of facts about Evan Ingram from last year that I am willing to bet you had zero clue about because when I saw them, I was shocked. Okay. First fact about Evan Ingram. He was a tight end two overall in PPR formats. He drew 143 targets, which was 16 more than any other tight end. He ran the most routes of any tight end last year. And he was second in yards after the catch of all tight ends. Those four are all true facts. You can go fact check me on that. I'm not going to sit here and tell you, though, that his 2023 season is prescriptive of 2024, that it's going to be repeated, that that season is here to stay. Um, Because I do think Christian Kirk only playing 12 games last year really did help Evan Ingram. But... Now this is two straight years in Jacksonville where you know he's been a top seven 
tight end in fantasy points per game and top five in total points each year. I think that's worth noting. He's 29 years old, so I, it'll keep him in the B tier for that reason alone. But Jacksonville has really, truly brought his career back to life, which has been really fun to see. All right, we're going to wrap it up with the C tier here, and I absolutely hate this tier, so I'm not going to spend much time on it. I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. Dallas Goddard, Cole Komet, Dalton Schultz, Jake Ferguson, and Michael Mayer make up the C tier now. I'm not going to talk about Goddard, Komet, or Schultz. I want to talk about the guys I'm, I'm most interested in talking about, which is Jake Ferguson and Michael Mayer, okay? There's a lot in play here for Jake Ferguson. And on the one hand, he had a great year stepping into the tight end one role for Dallas. 102 targets, 71 receptions. Both were top eight last year amongst tight ends. He led all tight ends in red zone targets as well at 25. So we like seeing that near the end zone. They wanted to feed him the football. Their scoring opportunity there. Uh, and he ran the third most routes of all tight ends last year too. So he was on the field plenty, getting valuable uh, routes and opportunities on the field to receive the football. On the other hand, though, the team still does have Luke Shoemaker, who they took in the second round of the 2023 NFL draft. You're probably like, what does it matter? Luke Shoemaker, whatever. Jake Ferguson's a guy. I mean, did Ferguson truly do enough to you know fend off Luke Shoemaker long term? Did Dallas just want to give Shoemaker a year to get acclimated to the league before you know throwing him on the field even more? There's question marks there. I think Ferguson might be the guy with the highest potential on this list given the Dallas Cowboys offense, but it's really contingent on him continuing to be the second receiving option in that offense. Now, Michael Mayer, he, I mean, totally opposite end of the spectrum rookie player last year. It was a you know season to forgive. He was personally my favorite tight end coming out of the draft last year. I loved Kincaid too, but I thought Mayer uh, possessed more of a well-rounded game that would get him on the field more quickly, which would replicate to more opportunity or translate, excuse me, to more opportunities quickly. Nope, did not <laughs> did not happen whatsoever. Uh, which is fine. I'll, I'll gladly take a miss on that. But I still think there's plenty of upside here because I still believe in his talent and draft capital. I mean, he was taken in the early second round, one pick after Sam Laporta. He was a third tight end taken in this draft and. Many experts in the in the industry, you know, were projecting him to be a late first round pick to a team like the Cincinnati Bengals, who who needed a tight end. But alas, taking in the early second round, the capital is still there. I still believe the talent is there, but I'd also be lying if I said there weren't a lot of things that need to break in his favor, uh, like better quarterback play, a bigger role in the offense, simply more snaps, maybe. Uh, and he's on the Las Vegas Raiders. I'm not exactly excited about the Las Vegas Raiders. I know people are saying they're 8-9. They were quarterback away from the playoffs. I I don't buy that. Not when your division was as bad as the AFC West was last year, and you're competing with Mahomes for how many years now? I I just don't buy the Raiders were as good as, as they projected last year. They, could they get better this year? Sure, absolutely. If they get a new quarterback, if they do get Mayer on the field more for more opportunity, right? I think they have young developing pieces, and Devontae Adams, obviously, See what happens with Josh Jacobs. Um, but there's time for, for Michael Mayer at 22 years old, right? His rookie season left a lot to be desired, but there's still time, okay? He's, I believe, the youngest guy on this list. So there's still a lot of time there. If I'm a Michael Mayer manager in Dynasty Leagues, look, I'm comfortably holding. Um, I think there's still potential for upside there. But again, the C tier is just, just gross with Dallas Goddard, Cole Komet, Dalton Schultz. Jake Ferguson, and Michael Mayer. Alrighty, that is it. That is all I have for you. Our top 15 Dynasty tight end rankings put into tiers. If you want to see our quarterback, running back, and wide receiver Dynasty rankings as well, you can view that on our channel where, hey, you should be subscribed already. And if you are, make sure you turn on those notifications as well because you're going to be alerted when all of our newest content is coming out. We're releasing a ton of Dynasty content. We're doing NFL draft content. We have daily shorts coming out as well. And that daily, three, four, five times a week, we're doing shorts in the offseason. And we're still talking fantasy football, all right? There is so much here that we are releasing for you all on the channel, so make sure you subscribe, turn on those notifications as well. Thanks for tuning into this video. Uh, I am at Lucas Wenzel. You can follow me at that on Twitter, last name Wenzel, W-E-N-C-S in cat L. Until we see you next time, stay safe, stay healthy. Deuces. Deuces.